The COB is presented by Rabobank. Awarded 2023 SMSF Savings Bank of the Year by Mozo. Hello, this is the COB, all the stuff you need to know about the day in business and markets. I'm Juliette Sali. And I'm Daniela Kouye. Well, Danny, let's have a look at how markets are faring at the end of the trading week. Of course, the first week of October, a week where we had yeah. the RBA hold. We're looking ahead to the uh, non-farm payrolls data and, you know, we are higher. Yes, we are higher today. It looks like we have a more risk on uh, mood pretty much across Asia. Hong Kong, when I last checked, was up about 2% and Ooh. the SIBO 200 is looks like it's closing up almost five points or four tenths of a percent. So maybe a few of the traders are sort of saying, well, maybe the bond markets had just gone a little bit too far in the short term and they're basically positioning for maybe a weaker jobs yeah, data because the, be the, the forecast we'll talk about it later but the forecasts are quite disparate in mm. terms of the range but nevertheless yeah well as you say the, the momentum has been about this bond route easing uh lifting stocks we also had the rba stability review that was sort of interesting in the fact that we're drawing down yeah, on those buffers that we yeah. had built up which i guess is kind of doing the RBA's job for them in a little bit. Absolutely, but there's quite some distressing numbers in that report. I was having a look at the lower um, income levels. They mm. really, really are stretched. Like their mortgage payments are greater than their incomes. Yes. So you do have to wonder, again, we've got this great split um, or bifurcation between a whole group of people that have no mortgages, benefit from higher interest rates and then a whole end of the other market mm. that is really struggle Struggling. street. And, and they're using their savings if they have them to Absol pay their mortgages but maybe if they don't then we're going to have to see a whole lot of either mortgage stress or people defaulting or having to sell their yeah, properties. Yeah which would be awful because mm. you know no one wants to see uh, little Aussie battlers losing their homes but let's hope it doesn't get that bad. Yeah and let's uh, of course we're looking ahead to, to the jobs data as well in the US and as you say that is quite range not range bound it's quite a big um, move in terms of what kind of Absolutely. ranges we're looking at yeah so the the, the bulk of the forecasts are around 70,000 um, jobs but it could be the range is from 90,000 up to 200,000 so there could be quite some volatility in mm. markets tonight when they when those numbers come out yeah and then that's all going to play into what the Fed does next high for longer we know Mary Daly kind of indicating that as well but you know are they going to pause are they going to hike again in November let's have a look at some of the sectors and particularly some of the interest rate sectors here in our market and have a look at the banks. they were really strong today yeah. and I was snooping around to see if I could find a reason but nothing except I do know that the US banks have been heavily heavily oversold Bank of America was at a 52-week uh, low. Okay, so West, Westpac has been upgraded, upgraded to a neutral from an underweight by Baron Joey. So so that's about the only yeah, reason, isn't I it? Mean, yeah, you're kind of digging around for, for reasons. Again, probably some bottom fishing there. And yeah. uh, let's have a look at the energy stocks because oil, of course, the miners, yeah, the miners first. Is. So we did hear from the CFO of BHP talking about lithium and the lithium potential right. shortage. Um, BHP looking pretty good though, up 1.5%. 1% Fortescue also um, that sort of rebound a little bit from the selling that we'd seen on the LME but as you say the energy space is really where it has all been with that further decline in the global benchmark oil price during Thursday but in electronic Asian trade we've seen a bit of a pickup Danny. Right yes it is it, it was a very weak week though we did see Brent crude off 9% which is the biggest fall since March and when I last checked there was a very ever so slight pickup um, today in the likes of Brent over in Asian trade. I do think our European gas has also fallen mm. quite a lot. And uh, tech 
stocks quickly as well, where they are sitting at the end of the day's trade. A bit of a bounce going on there. Looks like a wise tech uh, up 0.2% block, which has been under a lot of selling pressure. Mm. Coming back, what's really interesting is Technology One. So Technology One and Zero are going to report in November. Yep. Technology One has been so resilient, as has so Altium. What does it do? Sorry. Uh, it's basically um, software services, particularly right. for um, government sectors, mm -hmm. education, and they've been transitioning to the cloud. All right, and Block, of course, the Square parent, um, and I think it had City saying $60 this week and Ouch. down from 90 All right, some of the companies that we were following today as well, and Magellan Financial was a big one. The news that this beleaguered fund manager has recorded a $4 billion dollar drop in funds under management in September. So it actually... Um, oh, that's not correct. That's not correct, yeah, I don't think, because no. it dropped quite substantially Yeah, it was today. off about... Uh, 18%. So closed down 17% to $7.28. So uh, that is a really, really big fall. Um, interesting to note that GQG Partners, they also announced a small fall in funds under management, but uh, ever so slight um, down, um, looks like from 107 billion to 105 billion. Yeah. That share price, it doesn't tend to trade a lot this stock, but mm. up almost 4%. So that was in stark contrast to what we saw with Magellan. Yeah, and, and um, some companies paying out their dividends. They're not trading ex-div, but paying out their dividends. So no real impact to share prices, no. of course. But they're some of the ones that if you own those companies, you might have got a little boost to either your bank account or if you're in their dividend reinvestment plan, maybe you have more shares by the end of the day. And of course, stock of the day was Magellan Financial Group. And we had uh, Mark Morlin from Team Invest and David Novak, who gave us a rundown of what they thought of the company. Good look, um, but uh, you know, it's, look, uh, for me, you know, being a technical guy, I mean, this was the get out, get out at $55. Um, dollars. And I've never look, never seen a signal to get back in on Magellan, and still don't see one. So um, you know, it's it's um, it's more suffering for the shareholders who are still holding on to it. Uh, I would not touch the, the um, you know any funds management group right now, given with the bearishness of the market. So um, yeah, I'd be avoiding this one. And uh, but the one plus on this though is most of the funds that have been lost have been institutional. And the profit margin on that going on memory when we looked at it, I think it was about 0.2 or something, mm. whereas the retail is like 0.7. Mm. So, so you can actually lose like $3 of every, every $3 of institutional money is about the same as $1 of retail. Yeah. So they've kept a lot, most of the retail business they had, I think, you know, just paraphrasing here. Um, so it's not as bad as it could it would have been. Mm. But I think what has to happen now is you need to look at the actual Magellan's funds mm. and say so the, the actual managed funds, which I wouldn't yeah. put money in, but how are they performing? And if they start performing even a little bit positively to mm. um, their, uh, their, their benchmarks, whatever they are, yeah. it should stop. The, flow, yes. the, fun, the fl funds flow should stop going out. It and then I'd argue it's probably very cheap. Yeah, so the guests really looking for those funds under management to stabilise before you can get too excited mm. uh, about Magellan at this stage. All right, let's welcome now to the COB Shane Oliver, AMP's Chief Economist, for his take on what we've seen over the week. You did move down the bookshelf. We're seeing some different books. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Shane. That's right, I did. All right, let's talk about the key one in terms of that um, job starter that we're expecting from the US. Danny and I were talking about how the forecasts are quite wide in terms of what we could expect. That jolt starter earlier the week did give a bit of a, a shock to market participants. What are you expecting? How how do you think the Fed is going to react? Look, it, it's a difficult one. Uh, the business survey, the Australian well, ABP survey, it suggests a softer number, uh, but it's been very unreliable lately. And of course, the job openings number sort of worked the other way to some degree. Uh, market consensus is for a gain of about 170,000 jobs down from the previous month, unemployment falling slightly to 3.7%, down from 3.8%. But I, I think the focus would be on the headline jobs number. If it's still trending down, then the market won't worry too much and the Fed will be happy. If alternatively, we get an upside surprise, which is perhaps more consistent with the job openings number, 
and the fact that uh, unemployment claims remain very low, then obviously that will uh, concern the Fed. And I think you'll see another sell-off in bonds, unfortunately. Yeah, it's been quite a week, quite a few weeks, hasn't it, Shane, for this sell-off in, uh, well, particularly in US Treasuries. Um, As you said, more risk to the upside. Surely that would be pretty negative across the board for asset classes. Well, it would be. Uh, if you take shares, for example, our calculation of the equity risk premium in the US has collapsed um, because of this surge in bond yields and still relatively high uh, PEs or relatively low earnings yield. Uh, so we're almost uh, I th- well, we're at more than a 20-year low in the equity risk premium. Uh, it's currently around 0.5%. And in this environment of recession risk, geopolitical issues, politic, political issues in the US, it would argue for a higher equity risk premium as we've seen over much of the last 20 years, which is normally around 2 or 3%. Australia does look healthier, uh, but by the same token, in the short term, we will get buffeted around by whatever goes on in the US. So you're seeing this, uh, this, this backup in bond yields occurring at a time <clears throat> when the valuations for share markets are already somewhat stretched. And then when you allow for investor confidence, it's it's nowhere near as euphoric as it was at the high point or optimistic as it was back in July, early August. Uh, but it hasn't fallen to the sort of negative levels you'd expect at a major market bottom. So that, that would suggest that if we do see more upside in bond yields, it's going to put more pressure on share markets and obviously ongoing risk of further falls in markets. Later this year, you do get some uh, supports. You know, seasonality turns more positive starting from about mid-October, although we know from 1987 you know, the share market crash actually occurred a little bit later than that. I uh, shouldn't mention that one. And then, of course, uh, it does does start to pick up from November, December. And I think we will see more evidence that inflation's coming under, under control. The question is whether it's quick enough. Um, to yeah. prevent a more substantial fall in share markets. Well, you mentioned there the, I guess, robustness, if you want to use that term, that was what I use, not you, of the Australian economy amid these global economic pressures. But when we look at the RBA stability review that came through today, it does show that a rising number of households are on the cusp of economic stress, particularly at that lower end. I mean, how concerning is that? Well, I, I thought there was something for everyone in today's financial stability review, which <clears throat> tried to work all that out, sort of uh, put me back uh, in terms of writing my weekly report. Um, but, uh, yeah, on the one hand, I've seen economists out there saying, well, it suggests that households are weathering the interest rate storm pretty well, nothing to worry about, um, you know, no barrier there in terms of raising interest rates again. In fact, there's a line in there uh, where the RBA actually says that most households, most borrowers, a well-placed to withstand another rise in interest rates or something to that effect. Um, counter to that is, if you look beneath the, the conclusions and the wording and focus on those stats you referred to there, um, it, it does look more concerning. We are seeing more households in stress. Uh, I think on the RBA's estimates, where you look at mortgage payments uh, greater than 30% of income, we've now got more than 20% of households above that metric compared to something like 4%. Uh, back in April last year, and higher interest rates are still flowing through, obviously, to those on fixed rates. Uh, So that's concerning. For low-income households, it's over 40%. And that's despite the RBA producing a graph showing low-income households have enjoyed 10% real growth in their income. So there's a bit of an inconsistency between those two there, uh, even if you assume the, uh, the income numbers to be correct. So I think those sorts of signs... Uh, tell me that the Reserve Bank really needs to be cautious going forward here. Yes, there hasn't been a major problem to date, um, but there are growing signs of stress. And in particular, uh, when you say, well, households can manage it by cutting their their spending, uh, that's a problem in itself. Yes, they cut their spending and and an individual household can manage that well. But there is a paradox. uh, I forgot what Keynes used to refer to this in relation to, say, the paradox of thrift. Uh, that is what's good for the individual may not be good for the economy as a whole. If everyone says, well, many households say, <clears throat> well, we've got to cut back our spending and then we mm. can service our mortgage, they all do that. Spending goes down, unemployment goes up, and then you've got a problem anyway. So I think it's a time for the Reserve Bank to continue to tread cautiously. And I don't see the FSR as providing a justification or support or a green light, if you want to put it that way, for another rate hike. 
Really interesting what you're saying, Shane. Um, a friend of mine produces a more upmarket condiment, um, specifically a mayonnaise, and she was telling me yesterday her sales are off 20% in the September quarter. Wow. Now, I didn't know if that was year on year or quarter on quarter, but so much so that she's actually considering not even manufacturing for the, the, the run into the end of the year because the inventories are quite well, high. And I thought that was mm. really interesting because we're always trying to tease out the difference between those that have got mortgages, those that are more exposed to the interest rate hikes mm. versus you know, the, 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 the older demographics that don't have any debt. But here's a product that you'd think would be quite resilient and mm. yet they're already being hit. And I guess that then teases out, you know, the older demographic that does not have a mortgage is benefiting from higher rates. Do we have any idea how much their spending pattern affects, uh, you know, the Australian economy? Well, it's hard to get precise data on that. It, it obviously does have an impact. But um, I think what you notice from those stats, the, the RBA does go through from low income earners, they're the ones getting hit the hardest, despite their incomes going up the most, according to one of the earlier charts in that financial stability review. Um, but higher income households have also been affected. Um, but you're right, you've got a, a bunch of higher income older households, you might say, like mine, kids have left, mortgage under control, how much do we change our spending? Um, to be honest with you, I can't say that I've cut back things dramatically, um, but I would also say that I haven't increased things. And when I, uh, if I can't compare my Woolworths bill to what it was 18 months ago, it's well up. Mm. But that's, that does make me somewhat conscious, and therefore I've made an effort to uh, maybe not buy as much as I used to mm. or consider some cheaper options. Um, so I think older households do get affected by all of this, mainly through the cost of living issue. And there's all sorts of uh, equity issues and all of that, which I agree with and probably a topic for a different day. Um, but the fact that that, uh, that the mayonnaise sales are obviously what would be an upmarket sort of mayonnaise yeah. um, are being affected uh, tells me that there is a negative impact going on amongst higher income earners. The other thing to note is that even if, um, older Australians don't change their spending that much. They just keep motoring along as before. Um, that's still going to be a problem because you've got younger, lower income households starting to cut back quite, quite dramatically. So I don't buy this argument that, well, some households have benefited. Uh, if you don't have a mortgage, you've got money in the bank, you've got increased income from that, and that will offset the weakness occurring amongst other households. I don't buy that argument. I think that's totally fallacious. And I think the net impact will be a reduction in spending. And you're starting to see that. You look at the household spending indicator the ABS puts out, it looks at discretionary and non-discretionary spending. Discretionary spending has stopped. Yeah. Over the last 12 months, it's, it's, uh, there's no growth there. So in real terms, it's actually down. And per capita, per person, it's down quite a lot. So forget the lipstick index, Danielle's got the mayonnaise <laughs> index now. Dr. Shane Oliver That's from AMP, we thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Have a good weekend. Well, there we go. Now let's have a look at some of the leaders in today's trade and see Oh, what's happening there? So gold mining, interesting. De Grey mm. up, Evolution mining up. So the gold stock's starting to rally. Uh, Romelius as well. I think I always get my room. The, I am Romelius not the... Romelius and Romulus. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Romelius up by 5.3%. I'm just checking if that's a close. gold producer as well because I apologise. I am like the worst. Yes, gold. So there we go. Very much, it looks to me like the market again is positioning for a potential softer jobs report because mm. we do have three gold stocks uh, rallying quite heavily um, and they have been very, very heavily sold off with a weaker gold price but quite staggering given that they are producing and benefiting in Aussie dollars probably. Yeah. 
Um, and the insurers, we were talking about that earlier, yeah. weren't we? The, the big rally that you saw in insurance stocks today. So Medibank Private up 2.8%, QBE Insurance ending the day higher by 2.7%. And interestingly, a week ago, we were sitting here saying gold and insurance led the declines. Today, gold and insurance are up. <laughs> well, All there right, you go. let's have a look at the laggards as well. Um, and Magellan, we were talking about that. So the funds under management story there, uh, a 17.5% decline on the close. So a big whack to Magellan off by seven, uh, sorry, closing at $7.28 off by 17.5%. And, and PEXA, so I spoke to the CFO yesterday about their acquisition of Smooth. Um, and we did have Macquarie, I think, saying that they quite liked that acquisition. But okay. then there were a couple of other brokers that came through yeah. saying they were a little concerned. And certainly there was a bit of a, a sellout coming through from PEXA today, down 7.6%, uh, $10.09. But do listen to the interview on osbiz.com.au. Scott Butterworth the CFO talking about their acquisition into the UK of Smooth and this follows a year ago when they went into the UK as well um, with the Optima acquisition mm. so very much trying to diversify mm. into that market. Oh interesting and just having a look and no new news from Asira Resources they had their September quarter results out uh, earlier on in the week and uh, yeah so they're obviously a uh, bit of selling pressure there down nine percent as was brain chip off nine and call lithium off uh, over six percent. All right, the small cap leaders and laggards as well. Dacian Gold up nine percent, Next Science up by eight percent, and having a look at the laggards. There we go. Cyclofarm off ten percent. Uh, Sea Resources again off nine percent, as is Brain Chip. So uh, yeah, a few stocks getting a buffeted around again. And uh, it is all about jobs, as we've been talking about in terms of what we're expecting overnight. Uh, the US non-farm payrolls data for September. You also get US consumer credit data. That'll, that'll be really interesting because they have apparently been cranking up those credit cards, Ooh. those spends. And what's on next week? Because it is quite a big week. So what have we got? The NAB business survey is coming out for September. US consumer inflation. So that is out on Thursday, I believe. FOM see meeting minutes I think uh, they're coming out on Wednesday and I think China inflation in the latter part of the week yeah and China reopens of course exactly. after golden week and that'll be really important because I think we're looking to see whether uh, the spending how, mm. how it went because they typically spend a lot don't they in well they week? do and you know it's been interesting the last couple of years because it's always such a huge impact to so many economies with that whole week off you know going away mm. going overseas the last couple of years particularly with COVID yes. You yeah. know, it was domestic, but you were still seeing a little pick up in you know some of those areas like Chengdu, where the pandas are and oh, things. So I always my find son's it, been to Chengdu. Yeah, I've seen, to the, Chengdu. seen the pandas. I want to go. Oh look, I love a panda story for a Friday. <laughs> all right, that does it as well for Ausbiz for the week. But of course, you can catch up with all our interviews online via Absolute, the app. Absolutely, and uh, happy Friday to everyone. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll be back bright and early on Monday. Well, yeah. I will be. <laughs> I'll be in bed. No, just kidding. <laughs> we'll see you then. The COB is presented by Rabobank. Awarded 2023 SMSF Savings Bank of the Year by Mozo.